I say, and what you hear be in the name of God. Amen. I expected to see a whole lot more blue shirts. Oh, it's underneath. Okay. All right. I thought, uh, could I get away with a sermon that says, God bless Tom, God bless Bill, God bless Gronk. Amen. <laughs> now you're not that lucky. Now you're not that lucky. No. So Epiphany is sometimes narrowly thought of in terms of this, a season when we, re, we are brought to awareness of who Jesus is. Aha! Our epiphany is that Jesus is God somehow. He's God in the flesh. And while that's true, epiphany, <clears throat> and what the season is trying to bring to our awareness, is more comprehensive than that. It's not just that we discover that there's something unique about Jesus. It's that we discover that, how should we put it, that sentence in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven, is being lived out everywhere Jesus goes. So that, yes, he's God in the flesh, but everywhere he goes, the kingdom of God is showing up. And it's showing up not just because God's obeying his will, it's showing up because lives are being changed, people are being healed, sins are being forgiven. And that's, I think, ultimately the significance of this season. And Mark's gospel, he opens right out of the starting gate by hammering this kind of point home. And Mark and the other gospel writers do the same kind of thing where Jesus will teach, <clears throat> he'll say some things, like in Mark's gospel, what we didn't read in the verses before, Jesus taught, people said, with authority. And then what he taught was then backed up with actions. So Jesus taught about the kingdom, and we see the kingdom showing up in him because of the authority that he has and the power that he uses. So those, those two things are important. Now here, let me just say a word about power and authority, because they're not exactly the same thing although sometimes they can be so subtle it's hard to tell the difference. If I have a chainsaw, I have the power to cut down a tree. But if I take my chainsaw and go to my neighbor's yard and cut down his tree, I'll discover whether I had the authority to, to, chop, to cut the tree down. On the occasions that I've had the opportunity to give some counsel and advice to younger clergy, uh, I've tried to tell them that here's how, here's how you need to look at the rubrics and the canons of the church, the laws of the church. They're like a chainsaw. Okay, don't misunderstand what they are. So, for example, one of the laws of the church says that the rector shall have complete use and control of the building and everything in it which suggests that if the rector wanted to do it, he, has the he or she has the authority to rearrange the furniture. But if one were to take that canon too literally, now there's, a, there's an example, do we take the Bible literally? Do we take canon law literally? The answer is no. <laughs> because you start rearranging the furniture, you're going to discover whether you had the authority to do that or not. Because authority is relational. Authority is informal. And it isn't the kind of thing that people talk about or are necessarily conscious of. People who have authority within, say, a congregation, they're people who do things in the rest of the congregation when that person does them or says something, they all go, oh, yeah, oh, okay. That's the way authority works. So let's think about Jesus' authority. Now, his authority is also relational. His, his authority comes from the Father, right? His, his authority comes from his relationship with God the Father. And he teaches and, and talks as if he has the authority of God himself. And people recognize, oh, wow, he teaches with authority. 
But what really drives that home is what happens after he teaches. Now, the best example of this is actually in the next chapter, chapter 2, where Jesus is teaching in a synagogue or a home. It doesn't really matter. I don't remember which one. But it's all, the room is crowded, and people bring a paralyzed man, but they can't get in. So they somehow get him up on the roof and lower him through the roof. And having done that, Jesus looks at their faith and says to the paralyzed man, and presumably now on the floor in front of him, your sins are forgiven. Which immediately set off the leaders of the church because by what authority do you forgive sins? And then Jesus says, well, that you may know the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. Then he looks at him and says, son, take up your mat, get up and go home. And he does. The power makes the sense that it makes because of the authority. So imagine what would have happened if having lowered the man through the roof, Jesus had just said, get up, take up your mat and go home. Well, first of all, probably no one would have said, well, by what authority do you heal this person? They would have looked at Jesus and said, oh, another miracle a miracle worker. It's not as if people in the first century weren't aware of miracles. It's not as if people didn't sometimes do miracles from time to time. Look at Acts chapter 8, where Simon the magician is treated at, with respect because he has power. He's even called the great power of God. He somehow manages to, I don't know, do, what, do all kinds of miracles, but then he discovers that he really doesn't have any authority, that that authority comes from the Holy Spirit that's being poured out through the laying on of hands by the disciples. And now Simon wants that authority too. So both are important. The authority that Jesus has as he teaches and talks about the kingdom of God and his relationship with the Father and all of these things, and then the power that he uses to implement all that stuff in the world and in people's lives. In our Book of Common Prayer, in the service of baptism, the baptismal covenant, one of the questions that you'll find there is the question of, will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? The way to think about that is authority and power. Word, will you proclaim by word? So Jesus teaches with authority. He speaks, he talks, he utters, he says things. His word has authority. And then the things that he does have power or display power. And for our purposes, it can be either the kind of power that's supernatural or it might just be doing good things in the name of the Lord. You know, doing good in the world, fighting for justice and inclusion, all these kind of things. But if we simply go about fighting for justice and inclusion and all of these things and, no, and don't, are not clear about the authority from which we have this power, then our power is empty. I mean, what differentiates uh, Christians who go about doing good, but no one really knows why, from the United Way, the, the American Red Cross, or anyone else? Christians don't have a corner on the do-good market. You don't have to be Christian to do that. The only thing that differentiates the good that we do, the, the power that we wield in the world, whether it's by the power of the Spirit or just the power of, of feeding the hungry, divorced from the word and authority that comes to us from Jesus, it's meaningless. It doesn't mean a whole lot. So let me drive this point home because I think that we, we in the church are constantly tempted to divorce our work from the authority that we've been given. And we can never let that happen. So how do we live as Jesus was living? That is to say, in such a way that the kingdom of God is becoming present on earth as in heaven. And the starting place is you make Jesus the ruler of your life. And not just the ruler of your life, but you make him the center of your worship and your prayer. There's a danger of losing sight of the centrality of Jesus. The Episcopal Church is in danger of this. I think we've always been in danger of losing the centrality of Jesus. 
And I submit to you, we can't let that happen. We just can't. The scandal of Christianity has always been that the eternal dared, had the audacity to become finite. That the God who was present and active in creation through the pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night in the Old Testament is now part of it in the incarnation. He's become what he has created. Theologians call that the scandal of particularity. That God, in order for him to be part of his creation, not just present in it, he had to do it at a particular period of time, at a particular place, in a particular person. There's no getting around that. It cannot, you cannot do an end run around that. To do an end run around that is to deny the incarnation and the centrality of Jesus Christ. We live in the kingdom of God. We live in the kingdom of God on earth when we decide in advance to ground our worship and our prayer in him. When we decide in advance that we're going to make sure that our relationship with Jesus is known to others and that he is the center of our worship. The Jesus we worship today is the Jesus who liberated women, liberated tax collectors, liberated the the sinners, the prostitutes, the Samaritans, all of the outcasts of Jesus' day, he liberated him. Not just a concept of God, the second person of the Trinity didn't liberate anyone. Jesus Christ did this. So we can't just then turn around and then in our worship just excise Jesus from it. And the temptation is happening all the time. Well, let's not use the word Jesus. Why? Well, because, of course, Jesus is a, to borrow the words from a professor that said to Carolyn once, Jesus is a circumcisable Jew. And that's a scandal. That's a scandal. We need to make sure that Jesus is the ruler of our lives. Secondly, make God's word the rule over our choices. The authority that comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ also is, a, is one, an authority that is lived out in relationship with God's word. Now, I sometimes feel that when I mention the Bible, actually, I think the word Bible is going the way of the word evangelical. That if I even mention the word Bible, someone listening to me is going to shut down. Because the Bible is that book that people wave and uh, wield around like a club at people. And, you know, hogwash. Hogwash. Don't let the world, the media, or the right wing of, the, of Christianity hijack the one book that's going to point you to Jesus. Don't do it. Now, I'm going to pick on people with no names, without naming any names, but you're probably going to know who you are as soon as I say, my wor say the words. Remember back a few weeks ago, months ago, I had you do homework, and I had you read Romans 8. Some folks said, well, that's kind of fleshy. There's a lot of flesh in that chapter. Yep, there is. Yeah, there is. What is it about that word? I'm not going to ask you to tell me what you hear when you hear the word flesh. But if I were a betting man, I would say it had something to do with sex and sexuality. Now, the sins of the flesh do include sexual immorality, and maybe we need to be clearer about that, especially now, when we have seen what sexual immorality does to women and to little girls. Okay? Where do we go to and point to say, that is unacceptable not ever. The Bible. But it isn't just that. Let me give you the full list in Galatians chapter 5. It's sexual immorality, but it's also impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgy. That pretty much deals with everybody in the room. 
All right? There's a whole lot more about the flesh than just that. So we, we can't let the Bible be taken from us because a group of people have made it into something that is wielded against the wrong people, the people who are the sinners in our society. We can't let that happen because it's in the Bible that we learn about the story of God's work of salvation in the world. We learn about his whole plan of salvation from beginning to end. And finally, we need to make God's spirit the rule for our actions. We let the good works flow from the authority that we have in our relationship with Jesus through Scripture. Last week, I talked about how the Spirit of God was released in my life at an early age. And at least two other occasions, I've talked about how I've seen the Spirit of God released in a mission trip to the Dominican Republic, which I won't take the time to go into because it takes too much time. But it's powerful stuff. And if I had to summarize it, the power that I'm talking about is the power that relieves people of their guilt and the resentment and the anger and the bitterness that comes from it. Whether the guilt is deserved or not, here's the thing about guilt. A lot of people feel guilty who shouldn't feel guilty, but they still carry resentment and anger and bitterness because they've been made to feel guilty, and they need to be healed from that. And the word for that in, in Christian terms is forgiveness. The forgiveness that comes from being released from the bondage of sin and guilt and anger and bitterness and resentment. Our good works have to flow from the authority that we have in Jesus, through Scripture, into the works that we do. Whether those works are the kind of supernatural works that come from prayer and come from discovering a personal relationship with God and Jesus Christ, or whether those works are about feeding the poor, clothing the naked, welcoming the outcasts. Either way, it always has to be done in the name of Jesus, and our worship and prayer should be focused on him. The lordship of Jesus, the authority of scripture, and the power of the gifts for ministry, these are the means by which every person in this room can live the kingdom of God on earth as in heaven. Amen.